Hi, everybody. It's Mary Ellen Carroll, and I'm here on uh, 23rd Street and 10th Avenue in Manhattan in New York City, um, and in my apartment, actually, um, surrounded by my library, which um, gives a lot of comfort, actually, in this time. I had been out of the city for over six weeks um, and came back last week to a very different place than what I um, know and love. Um, and it is evolving. Um, in some ways, things are not as bad as depicted. And in other ways, um, I would say that they're worse. Um, so I think being able to have this conversation with Mumumba at this point is really important to uh, consider not only the role of culture and art in particular, but also uh, the policy decisions and then um, infrastructure as well. I'm leading an earth which is a working group called the Rights of Future Generations Working Group, uh, which basically really um, uh, have the aim of developing a charter and a policy perspective on how do we conceive um, policy decision making in the interest of future generations. Uh, from the perspective of the global south, at the heart of issues related to the rights of future generations is the environmental degradation, inequality, racism, uh, um, and inequality obviously include both the social dimension but the gender dimension So uh, five years ago, I was uh, invited to join uh, the Lambent Foundation. Uh, that's a private foundation here in New York that funds in New York, Nairobi, and New Orleans, um, geographically. And um, it was the executive director, Michelle Coffey, and then uh, Yona Becker who I was with. And it was the 10 year anniversary of Kwani, uh, which is a literary journal that has a huge influence in the world. Um, but what they have done and the presentations that were done during that week um, really represented, you know, it was Pan-African, but there were other people from all over the world. and. There was a talk that was given at Kenyatta University by uh, my friend, Ivan Ediambo Awar. And the one thing, you know, um, there were students that were there that were standing in the back. We were seated, um, you know, in the middle of the room. It was a classroom. Maybe there were a hundred people that were there. And Ivan got up and started to read uh, an excerpt from her novel that just was published and but before she started she said then I'm gonna say some other things and after she finished reading she pointed back to the back of the room where you know students generally we all know from teaching tend to gather in the back either both as an escape route and she said that, you know, it was a sort of veiled call to action, right? So Lumumba, in talking about like the future and generations, I think this is really, um, you know, something that's an invaluable point for us to talk about um, as we continue in the conversations. But Yvonne said, 
that, you know, it's really necessary to utilize the ethical imagination. And when she said that, right, I mean, like even Obama talked about the moral imagination, but the ethical, the difference between that is significant. And it's something that has stayed with me and that I've utilized and I, we're continuing to utilize it now for it was something that we're working on for, with an organization for something called 2020 Visions. But I think that that sort of position of how and what, right? Not so much the why of things, but how and what is being done and the effect and impact and how you know, it's reimagining, but it's really imagining what these things can be because what we know is that our worlds have been turned upside down. It was already starting with the climate crisis that's going to continue, but it has been completely exacerbated with COVID-19. And it affects everybody, right? It's, it's no one is um, has some kind of secret, you know, barrier shield against COVID. Nobody does. And I think once we understand that level, right, of impact, um, it engenders another kind of process and thinking um, that one chooses to participate in um as a kind of collective whole um uh, for the present and then that will affect actually the future so that's that's a long answer to <laughs> where ethical imaginations origins are from so it's east african um as many things um that we know about the uh, start of, of civilization. And of course, um, what I would, I would add is acknowledging that reimagining another world is a categorical imperative for the very reasons you have given. And when I speak about reimagining another world, I'm speaking of a new world, the world of equal belonging, a world characterized by equality, dignity, and respect of the members or all the members of the human family. Uh, and I think that's that's something very important to bear in mind when you or when one speaks of of reimagining of course the how and the what uh, um, uh, cannot be shaped without at least a perspective or a desire for something noble and worth reimagining. So, so this is this is one. The second thing is for us to reimagine that this world we speak about in the this time of COVID nineteen, we need to really uh, address what exactly is going on? What happened? Because the coronavirus epidemic is a seismic rupture into 21st century neoliberal civilization. It's a, civil, it's a, a civilizational rupture to its political economy, its cultural and deep ideological ethos, its anti-environmental zeals and practices, its anti-humanist uh, 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 reasoning and rationalization, 
uh, in pursuit of the primacy of cash. Cash is king. In fact, one would go as far as defining neoliberalism as cash is king. And humanity are disrupted. COVID, the second aspect of it is that COVID-19 has exposed the utter terrifying misery of the human condition in 21st century. We may speak about our wonderful IT devices, artificial intelligence, but 90% of humanity lives in absolute poverty and insecurity. 90% of humanity feels marginalized. As such, we need to address this because if, if you are a member of this human family and you know deep inside, whether they say it or not, that you are disposable, then there's a serious problem. There's a serious problem that, okay, zero our contract is the mode of the most dominant mode of employment to knowledge workers and janitors. And the impact of that is that a few accumulate trillions of dollars and then suddenly they turn to us and say, well, Philanthropy can address this miserable abject poverty in which we live. And the other element that I want to highlight here is that one of the interesting phenomena that has been exposed by COVID-19 is the perception that was never uttered publicly, but now is clear, that wealth, progress, and advancement are conceived as white, male, and Western preserved. And that's why the apocalyptic seizures that trust get into when he hears of China, okay, are really a reflection of something that Bertrand Russell wrote about in his small book called On the China Problem, in which he speaks about the white nations rejection to the possibility of accepting China or any other nations being their equal. If we do not understand and take cognizance of these issues, we are going to use spears and aspirins to solve the problems. When you talk about, you know, humanism and um, and what these approaches can be, but then also, you know, in introducing Bertrand Russell, um, you know, if we talk about the economics of this and globalism, I mean, initially you were talking about, you know, the infrastructure projects um, that are being developed in Africa um, with China um, and that extend the One Belt, One Road, um, making it possible to go from essentially Beijing all the way you know, to uh, the tip of um, 
Africa. Um, and I think that, you know, to introduce the role of culture, because um, this is something that, you know, I do and you are a part of as well. And because of the context of Ulcer Call, um, that this is foundational to who we are. And now, um, I think more than ever, um, the importance, right? So the, the necessity of, of living, right? Being able to eat, have shelter. Um, we are going to see massive changes occurring um, because of food and food security, right? So those are elemental uh, considerations that are paramount to, to everyone's survival. And as you noted, the disparity and how things are being done in the, the white nations, I mean, the United States is not doing, uh, isn't doing very well, obviously. I mean, look at what a um, horrendous uh, response um, or lack thereof has occurred since the start of COVID. I mean, they've known about this since January and nothing was put into a place. Um, and, you know, I think that what a lot of people are possibly seeing is just how, um, you know, how not only the bipartisan, but also that the states essentially are, um, act as, but are not their own entities. And I think that one of the things that you know, what I appreciate about what you were saying, and I want you to, to parse it out some more because there's also some just very pragmatic things of, of talking about, you know, being able to uh, feed oneself and to find shelter. And I think that the migration that's going to take place that we've already seen, right? The work that we've been doing at the US-Mexico border that we're doing now with um, you know, 123 uh, artists for a project that's related to uh, the children that have been detained and separated, um, is that there is a material consideration that art can actually play. And I think from also the conversations about, um, you know, the environment and the climate crisis, I was at the UN Youth Summit, I was at the main summit, I was at the General Assembly this year. And I mean, part of that is that it's a platform for people to um, introduce their ideas and their particular positions. And, you know, it's like as any conference where the real meat and things happen usually outside of um, you know, standing on the day to make um, some kind of, of, of um, articulation, right, of a kind of policy. But I want to get into some more meat about some of these ideas and things and what you're thinking about and seeing in this advising of the future. And I mean, I've said this before, I mean, you know, what we've been talking about in particular in regards to, you know, these atrocities that are taking place. So first of all, of course, there's invoking Adorno on that when he was writing about um, the use of the experience of people that went through um, both personally and then people that they knew and their families um, through the Holocaust. And what does that say to utilize that in terms of some kind of aesthetic that's created? But then more importantly, I mean, the person that I have really been going back to rereading very extensively is Hannah Arendt. And essentially these thinking acts that we do um, and how we do them, how we do them as artists or whatever the role that we have as cultural institutions now with the sense of the future, right? 
I mean, she talks about the consideration of the future generations that the ability for people to have that level of understanding is a privileged, right, position to be able to take that view if you can versus when if you have to figure out some way as everybody is going to be confronted with soon enough of how things have shifted so dramatically. So, you know, the American dilemma is are simply mag are across the world. I mean, the issues around immigration, migration are, 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 are part and parcel of what is happening the rest of the world. Wherever you go, yeah. okay, the African continent, if you take, for example, okay, South Africa has been a recipient of many, okay, uh, 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 citizens from its neighboring countries are going across, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. But I think the movement of people is a symptom of a different type of malaise, which is the absence of development and lack of opportunity. That's one. And it will necessitate a different sense of radical solidarity in 21st century. Yeah as we speak, because all the charters on human rights, all those things are being undone by populist movements across the world, but particularly in the Western countries. Yeah. So activists, cultural activism in particular, okay, uh, and progressive, need to move beyond these simplifications of the NGO thinking. Or they're poor, they need some water, and therefore you buy some uh, chlorine, you drop on a, a bucket of water. And that address the systemic mm -hmm. issues. Why is it that members of the first world and leader of the world economy, okay, is not addressing fundamental issues of global economy in terms of development, in terms of uh, 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 equity and sharing of wealth within its own economy and across the borders. I don't think that it will hurt the United States if it helps Latin American countries, Mexico included, et cetera, okay, to become equal economic partners and developed. And so I absolutely agree with you. I mean, I've always agreed that there has to be um, you know, if there's um, expansion and globalism, right, that there has to be something that is mutually, right, that is, there's reciprocity and that there is a way in which the um, investment is not one of extraction but it's a way in which there can be something that is developed. So with infrastructure, for instance, that becomes sustainable and that there is a sort of um, manner in which it is where the entity always can maintain its own autonomy. And there isn't that kind of inequity and disparity that we've seen for uh, centuries. And, you know, I, I, it's, there's a lot of questions of, you know, in this regard of the, the, also when you talk about radical, right? I mean, you know, there's, 
I, I use that word very um, self-consciously because what is, you know, what is radical? I mean, there's a group that's working on economics now from uh, two young economists that wrote a book called Radical Markets and that somehow the market is the way in which these solutions can be developed and where they actually do something that most people don't do usually is that they really put concrete proposals, some of which are very effective, some of which are not at all. But I think that also the ability to, it's not only to think and talk about it, but it's actually what can be done, right? Where is the sort of action? Like even we've talked about Extinction Rebellion, right, of which I am, have done work with them. But where's the point of not only making it visible in the public for awareness, but then to start to affect policy and, um, and the ways in which things can be re- um, Evaluate, right? Not only the evaluation, but then also where are the excess to resources to make these things possible? And yeah. uh, so I, you know, I'd like to hear some more about what you think about the sort of role of activism in concert with, um, you know, also with sort of policy and then infrastructure. And, you know, I will also say that, you know, the, the art world is ultimately one of the most conservative arenas um, <laughs> in, um, in terms of disciplines. I mean, people think that it's um, where boundaries are truly um, sort of expanded and it can provoke thinking and uh, responses, and it's important to have that. But I also think that there's also, you know, as I was asking you, that role between activism and policy and what can be done and, and where are you seeing things? I mean, I'd like to hear an example from you of what uh, these dialogues that you're having about the future while you're in charge of what that's what what is that sounding like right now well thank you 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 have raised so many issues i'm not sure whether i'm uh, capable <laughs> of addressing all of them but let me let me just <laughs> by, by the few things that are, 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 i think are very important first of all i think um, we have a simple point that we need to take into consideration. What is at play now is a global financialization. Yeah. And therefore we have to separate between real economies and these financializations and games of staggering wealth accumulation. Mm. This is one. The second, and in doing that, obviously, I personally do believe that any informed, enlightened citizenry is a radical and a progressive act. If you hold your, your government accountable, I can start by as, as, as basic and central issues in democracies, every political officer in office has been elected to in a manifesto, to a pledge to serve members of that nation. So you will start by that discussion. 
I don't think that it's difficult to say, okay, we have realized today in United States that millions and millions of people have no health insurance. And that's really something that is problematic and need to be addressed. That the government need to put its money where it matters for the well-being of its citizens, etc. Developing countries, the situation might vary. Some of these countries would be what Hannah called authoritarian, totalitarian regimes. You name it. It's still they have responsibility to say, this is something that we do not accept and we do not agree with. There are different forms of participation and making uh, one's uh, uh, um, voice uh, matter. The second point with regard to uh, uh, um, what you have raised, and I am not really familiar with their work, but what I would say, repackaging free market ideologies and calling it radical is radical in the negative sense of it. <laughs> That's what I would say, because today's dilemmas are direct product of free market financialization of the global economy. And I have to say, even when we speak about global economy, what, who are we really speaking about? When we speak about global economy, we are speaking of the Western dominant economies plus the BRICS. That's it. The rest of the nation states of the world are not participants in that economy. They're receiving ends. So I'm not sure what exactly they mean by radical economy or radical markets. If the, if, if the ultimate desire of these markets is to deregulate and to simply okay, suck every single penny, there will be no progress because you end up yeah. with well that's not yeah their thesis isn't that exactly i mean we don't need to go into too yeah. much detail about that but yeah. i want to go back and push a little bit on the role of culture because i think that there is ways in which there can be intersectionality that actually works and i'm going to give two concrete examples um both of which, I mean, we, we did something in South Korea um, as a part of uh, the Busan Biennial that was uh, Roger Bergel, who did, uh, was the executive director with Ruth Nowak of Documenta um, organized. And with something like that, there was a consideration of, of sort of sustainable practices um, and the performance of actually buildings and what could be done, how that could be looked at. And something like that in the model of a biennial where things get either dropped down into, right, from like outer space for like that moment for the few months that they're happening, huge amount of resources going into that happening. And then they get taken out and maybe they get put in some other place in another part of the world. Or there's other approaches where it's something that's really deeply seated that takes time and will is a model, right, that is not only sustainable, but in its thinking is something that will continue in some way, right? And so at 
you know, what I have been seeing and what I think is actually really interesting right now about what you're talking about with this group of people and what All Circle Avenue has done and continues to do is to privilege the local, right? I mean, it's like you take care of what is with you and in front of you and, um, and how that needs to, um, what's the attention that needs to be paid, right? To, to make, right? Not only the organizations or the entities or the individuals thrive and survive, but that they can continue in that way and that they can do that in, for others as well. And so with that, I think one of the things in talking about health, right, it's, it's, a, it's an abomination that the, the United States does not have national health. And let's hold on uh, for the next few months to see what's going to happen, particularly with COVID. And as you also talked about developing nations, what models need to be created or how they can be created. But a few things that we, we were just on a conversation. So a model that I saw in Houston, um, Texas, um, which people have very strong opinions about, uh, which I always like because then uh, if you know they make ad hominem arguments about a place, it's truly the understanding that they don't know it. And I would also say that that was my experience before the first time that I went to the UAE and to Dubai and talking to architect friends of that they saw they were very one dimensional, which for people that are making buildings and infrastructure, I was really astounded about. But I think that there is this way in which my point is, is that these institutions now are looking at how there can be an intersection between both uh, culture and food and infrastructure and to be the ones that are developing it and making it integral too, right? So if culture is providing a kind of foundation to, uh, you know, society in a way, in the same way of sustaining us, that being able to work, but then also where is like food and food policy that's a part of that and health. So one of the things that's happening at an institution that just opened in Washington, D.C., called The Corner at Whitman Walker, was that it was a clinic that came out of the AIDS crisis 20 years ago and has continued to provide general health care and services now expanding, but still with focus on particular underserved communities. And they have opened a cultural center. And, you know, to some people, that could be, you know, head scratching, but I think that there is this moment now that we're seeing where there is a kind of, um, I think that, they, that there is this way that things can, as you said, reimagine, I said, imagine, right? What, the, what these possibilities are. And it's on, it's a policy level and it's an infrastructure level, but then it's also just a very pragmatic level of how and what can be done and what is, what is the acts that are going to be done. And it's not necessarily waiting for permission from somebody in a position of authority to tell you, yes, it's about moving resources, but I think that the, the, the ability to understand that you have the voice and can act, that comes from the ground up. That's not from somebody telling you that you, you are able to do that. That's modeling on seeing, oh, my neighbor, like come and, and be a part of this and we can actually shift this and affect this in a way that's extremely um, powerful. 
Maria, yes. I would agree with you that, that <laughs> let, let, let me just uh, yeah. say three things. First, yeah. on the cultural aspects, fundamentally is it is not something that is linear. And, and, and the classical example I, I always give, okay, is Picasso. Yeah. When the Paris Expo commissioned him, okay, nobody expected that he would produce the Guernica. Yeah. He himself didn't know. Then he sees the moment to speak about the most important issue of the day for him as a Spanish and a European. The war of fascism. And you can see, okay, the impact of that. It's part and parcel of many contributions that happened during that year. Mm -hmm. You have the contributions of somebody like him, you have contribution uh, uh, like uh, who was the um, the editor of the Tribune um, Orwell, for example. Yes. And have on the other side was um, the author of To Whom the Bell Tolls, Hemingway. Okay. Th these are different contributions that just emerged from that environment, and there was equally contribution that was economic etc so for the first for first thing that i want to say we should not find culture as simply okay in in a, a closed manner. any contributions that is knowledge production that addresses humanity's concern are part and parcel of culture as far as I'm concerned, uh, 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 as far as I'm concerned. So Dr. Fauci, who is a scientist and a big, is a cultural activist in his public role. Yes. Addressing, enlightening people about what to do and what not to do. And, and even we can learn a lot about the way he addresses, okay, the media, okay, how, I mean, as a diplomat, I have the utmost respect and regard for him that he is speaking to a president who can literally ask him to walk out of the room, okay, but at the same time, he, in a very meaningful manner, will veer him away from some very difficult pronouncement or proclamations. Let me put it this way. This one. So what is important here is the creation of the platforms and the spaces for participant to participate and produce what is needed because we don't know what are the solutions. So that's, that's what I would say on culture in general. The second side of it, which is equally a very important part of the concern, is the issue of global public health and public good. Because what this coronavirus has made clear to us is that public health and public goods are inseparable. Mm -hmm. The well being of our citizenry, the global citizenry and individuals etc are inseparable there is no more a divide between the wealthy okay cocoon behind their high walls okay and the poor the, Indi the, the indian billionaire and the have not face the same tragedy if because, because unlike other diseases where most likely to savage the poor, coronavirus 
equalizes among us. All the races, all the genders, all the places, all the corners of the world. So, so the, 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 the debate around public, global public health is now central and is something that need to be reflected on and policies have to be developed, etc. And that goes back to the infrastructure you talk about. Yeah. How do you think about Wall Street and New York, where you have the financial center of the world with all its wealth. But at some point, there were not enough beds, not enough PPEs. What does that tell us? is that the priorities, okay, have been skewed. And there must be a real systemic and fundamental correction. And the same I, thing, uh, sorry, and the same thing with regard to essential workers. Yeah. Now we discover that people who work it doesn't matter what sort of job they do. All these jobs are meaningful and contribute to our well-being. And to continue to disregard their contribution and pay them dead nothing yeah. is not acceptable. And I, in fact, one of the most radical things and most fundamental things must happen now that public health servants and, 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 and workers pay and work conditions must be globally revised and updated because the centrality of their role to our own well-being. A couple of things, I mean, in terms of like the role of diplomacy and, you know, you're being a diplomat um, and essentially having a voice that is a voice that is your own voice, but it's a voice for many. I mean, that's, um, and it's also, it's not only a voice, but it's also in terms of communication, it's the ability to listen and to hear and then to process, right? what that is and it's looking i mean you invoked hemingway and uh before it was melville and um you know uh picasso i mean there's others um i mean you know i would throw in gertrude stein and virginia wolf and um you know, um, you know, I think that in particular poetry now is very, very um, important um, because, I mean, personally it always has been to me, but there is a, a condensation, all right, and a distillation of language and writers from the global south and, and in particular that uh, what globalism did make happen is that it did make that uh, content, right? And those, and that invaluable sort of uh, resources available. So, um, so I think that then, you know, the, 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 those things exist in terms of the citizen and then the representative, right, of the citizenry, right? So in the role of diplomacy, and I think that culture plays a diplomatic role. Um, we've seen this. Um, I think that there's ways in which, you know, the market of the art fair and biennials, um, which people are, you know, understandably there's criticisms about, but it does bring in um, particular, you know, 
perspectives and uh, and people move through and into those places where they haven't been before. You know, I'm not a technocrat, but I do think that there is there are ways in which you know we have evolved that even now how we're conversing and seeing one another in somewhat real time of what this system can have the and the effect that it can have and and how to make it something talking about either in developed or underdeveloped you know it's or developing uh locations that if everybody had the same kind of access and it's treated as a kind of public space for the public good right as a public square i think that that's one step so lumumba i um in 2012 um Franklin Sermons, who is, uh, he was at the Demon Ale in Houston. He knew about my work, Prototype 180, that's still ongoing after 20 years. Um, and then he was in LA and he's now the director of the Paris Art Museum in Miami. So he was the director of Prospect 3, which is the biennial in New Orleans. and he uh, commissioned me to do a work there. And so what I had been working on was actually, um, when uh, we were doing the live video stream in 2008, which now, you know, everybody is like, oh, who cares, like, are you kid? Like, that's so common, you pick up your phone, but it wasn't common at all at that point. And, what it had me move was from doing work related to policy on the ground and below the ground into the airwaves. And it was Nam June Pike who coined the term, the information superhighway, the Korean artist. He also said that the airwaves are going to be far more valuable than going to the moon and not in terms of, I mean, he was referencing the economics, but it was really about the use of it. So what that got me sort of thinking about was I was already doing work with radio frequency and spectrum and how these invisible strata that are in the airspace above every location um, and how they can be utilized for the greater good of the greater all. And remember TV, right? You plugged in a television set, you put up maybe antenna ears on top, and you received television reception. There was not a cable company you had to pay. There wasn't a cell phone company you had to pay. You bought the box, you plugged it in. It's like the radio. So with that, when everything was shifting to digital, right, from analog, there were the old UHF and VHF channels, ultra high frequency, very high frequency, that were going to be made available. And so what I worked on extensively, and not only in the US, but many locations in the world, because my colleagues at Rice University, we had developed basically what was a two-way radio, which is what Wi-Fi is, so that you could use those unused low frequencies for high-speed broadband access. And, you know, we went to the FCC here and made the case um, for it to be unlicensed, which means that, you know, if you made the device to use it, you could, as long as it was in those regulatory guidelines, this would have had, this was a radical 
um, use of this space. And I think that it's still possible now. I mean, countries have sort of auctioned it off, which is, um, you know, the same happened in the US, which I think is just abysmal in terms of what the opportunity, because what they ended up seeing, a group of economists in 2011 were commissioned, albeit it was by Google, but they ended up doing a white paper on this, on, um, on Wi-Fi, and it was called Super Wi-Fi, and making the case. So a slice of Wi-Fi is at 2.4 gigahertz. This was basically like an entire country of unused spectrum. And what I was doing in New Orleans was that we had made the device so that you could use it for, uh, it's basically essentially a radio, like, you know, Wi-Fi is sort of a radio, but you can send and receive. And I ended up getting experimental licenses from the FCC here in the US. And to make the point, when Robert Moses designed the interstate, the highway going from California to Florida, it cut through, they routed it through New Orleans. And they intentionally went through the most important historical African-American neighborhood in the seventh ward that made this elevated platform through the middle of the city that divided and decimated that community. So in talking about underserved and in talking about sort of radical, like, you know, my, the approach to public utility too was what if we think of like giving the most advanced technology to the public, to the underserved, to reconnect, right? You're not gonna re, you're not gonna bring those people, the diaspora was, it was created by their policy that was done to make that highway going through. But if we shift into the airwaves and say, okay, for education, for culture, for social justice to use that space. And I think that one of the things now that we're seeing, and I'm getting contacted about it again, is that with COVID, we know how to do this. It's just having the political and the social will to make it happen. And that, that is you know a, a very concrete way of putting it into action of because also it will have the impact environmentally so that's the same so we ended up doing it um and it it was up and usable and part of it too was that look at it's like electricity right we we turn the light on but when electricity was first making it possible for there to be illumination, people had to have an understanding of what that was and how it would work. And this, I think, is a way in which, um, and because of people not traveling now, we are seeing the impact that it has on the environment, right? For, we've had like a brief pause, as you said, of like the Mother Earth is taking a gasp right now. Um, so, so anyway, that's that's specifically what the policy and the program, and it's a, you know, it's a technology play, but it's also a policy play. In my my own mind, okay, that there's never been. A separation between technology and policy, power and economics. Uh, and this is very important these days because as you have seen, the digital divide itself is already, okay, exposing okay, the vulnerability of, of the poor 
on the impoverished and the vulnerable societies. We have now situations where significant members of our communities globally have no access to education because they don't have the infrastructure. They don't have yeah. computers, they don't have uh, 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 Wi-Fi or connectivity, okay, for them to receive okay, any kind of education. And you think if this goes on for one year, it means these guys, these kids, okay, are totally disadvantaged. They will go back to classes, okay, if, if the situation normalizes, okay, they are one year behind. Already, the fact that, and, and this is one of the interesting things that I, uh, I realized when I read Maxwell um, from the New Yorker, even kids from poorer backgrounds, just a holiday, those three months makes a lot of difference between those who come from middle class families mm. because they have access to uh, uh, resources, to cultural avenues, to all sorts of things that will make them advance. The gap will increase. So one of the things that I do believe that is important in this project that we are doing is, 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 is to, to see this link and the importance of this link now, because it's not anymore a hypothetical issue. It's an issue where, okay, uh, um, majority of people accept it is in the national interest of any society not to disadvantage its future generations because these are the people who will inherit those societies. Yeah. So imagine, okay, the impact of, the, of lack of education on personal well-being of these individuals and of those nations where Okay. we talk about knowledge economy, global knowledge economy. So what becomes of that global knowledge economy if you, how would you participate? What's your future? So this is, this is one central issue. Uh, uh, I think it, it is important to, to address. And, and of course it would necessitate summoning the political and the social will to translate it into a given, into mm -hmm. a public good. I don't see that, okay, for example, uh, uh, it's a bad thing either to make it an imperative to have access to, 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 to computers, etc. Think about it. Any of the billionaires or the trillionaires in the United States is capable of providing every single household with two computers and that will not cost him anything, at least in his city or where he comes from. Looking for avenues to, to, to do that is, is important. And of course, I think equally, okay, these are the sort of things that even the Congress, okay, and the Democrats need to look at, uh, 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 and the Republicans too, because these are, these are things that affect the well being of many kids who are the future of their constituencies. I wanted to, to, to stress that because it's, at this moment, it's, it's, it's a very crucial issue for, 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 for future generations. The second issue, we come to the, um, 
to the issue of radical solidarity. My perspective is that a lot need to be done. And there must be cohort or groups of like-minded people who can put their efforts and make meaningful contributions characterized by injustice, inequality, uh, and disparities across board. And it has reached a situation where actually it's very critical to and very urgent to do something about these injustices, inequalities, etc. Because not only uh, it, it, is it is it morally wrong or ethically wrong, it is equally renders our societies ungovernable. There will come a time when people will not accept it. As such, we need to reimagine societies, a society that is characterized by real justice and equity and dignity. So um, that was exactly what I was going to say. Thank you. But but seriously, Lumumba, I mean, it's, um, you know, it's really a privilege to be in conversation with you about this. I think that um, rather than there being sort of antagonistic views, it's that we, um, we do have radical solidarity with one another and seeing things um, in uh, a similar perspective, but also in, in taking action um, in, um, in regards to each of our work um, and how we work both within the local, but also still within the global and and the world i mean i like using the world um, more than using global um because it has um it hasn't been the world hasn't been co-opted as much um in terms of economic uh uh you know use or exploitation and I think that, that a, a just and equitable, um, you know, sometimes I think people um, can counter it with saying, oh, well, that's so, you know, those are such high ideals. And the reality is, is that this is how things um, are playing out. And I think that we're seeing it with COVID of where um, the regard for the most vulnerable um, and the most knowledgeable, right? Um, which are like the elderly and, and people within a particular segment of society who have had the experience um, and understanding of what that kind of humanity actually is. And that that needs to be regarded. It needs to be sort of, um, you know, taken care of. Um, and I think that the way in which we make a decision to do that um, and to come together and to think about the stewardship, right? This all doesn't just happen. It's that we're participating in it and we have a responsibility actually to ensure that it's done in a way that creates an equitable and just world for all that that certainly happens within the local but then it expands um, from that point radiating out into um, to other locations from from there and i think just to, to go back just to where we 
all are physically right now. And to say that, that All Circle Avenue really truly does this. Um, and I think that part of doing that um, and representing that as a model is that it's also being aware of um, and being vigilant about, you know, not looking over your shoulder all the time, but really considering how you're doing something and the manner in which you're doing it. And it's not to just jettison it, right? If it's not working, but what needs to be adjusted and how, um, you know, how is that possible? And I think that's one of the things that we're really seeing right now too, is that, um, that you know, the, this is, uh, you know, with the, the climate crisis and everything else that's going on, I think COVID has really exposed all these kinds of vulnerabilities that exist and what is necessary, as you said, right? What what um, what will continue and what won't continue and um, and just to end with the work of art, I mean it absolutely is necessary, right even in that non utility um, and existence right that it only has to be itself, and we right, see ourselves in relation to those kinds of things and experiences. And I think that there needs to be more of that and made so that it's made more um, visible and accessible. And, you know, as you said so eloquently earlier, that is that it's about, it is a form of diplomacy and it's about communication. And I think being able to engage in a dialogue and to work on things together um, is, is radical solidarity. I agree, I, I agree with you. On, on this too, I just want to emphasize one thing. Yeah. And that's the imperative of evolving an importance of evolving social movements. Nothing can happen at the individual level. Yeah. However, however uh, 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 um, uh, important the contributions that we can make as individuals. At the end of the day, change is a collective effort by, by majorities by groups of people etc this is this is done and the second thing of course one of the realizations here now is that a utilitarian approach to understanding things in terms of cost benefit analysis will not work a, a work of art has merit and has a lot to, to contribute into our well-being, okay? As, and that's one of the reasons why if you, if what are the first, what are the really, how do we trace the origin of humanity? By artifacts, artwork mm -hmm. of early humanity. I think that's, that, that should validate the fact that art and culture in its different forms are inseparable, okay? And utilitarian calculus, okay, is not the only way of understanding things. The more broader uh, ways and more meaningful ways of understanding the needs of today. Can I just ask you? We Excuse me, one thing. I One thing that I just came to mind was then, what would you say then about commitment and how that commitment is actually then made, right? I mean, 
it's it's the individual and the the aggregate right as the social but then it's also the commitment that's made you know on the level of like the the diplomatic or the government or right that needs to be happening as well and i would also say the commitment of the work of art too I, I, yes, I, th I don't think that I would disagree with you. Uh, the, the two things that I will emphasize is the following. As far as individual leadership is concerned, it takes character. And different societies produce different individuals according to the circumstances and the situations we, they face. Gandhi could have not been produced in Germany or German society. So, so Churchill or uh, Mandela, or Lincoln, or Hitler, or Fairfoot, or Big Boy. These are, so there's an element there. But what is important and the most underestimated element in this is the role of character. It's the shape of and the content of and the sub substance of that character that makes that commitment. Because to be able to believe in something and to commit to doing it at all costs is a product of the character of the, the individual or the person. But then it's replicable, and 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 there will be a group that influence each other, and they be become a trend. So it's a drop; it becomes a river, and it will run until it's open new avenues and new and and, and new ways. That's the way I would I would, I would, I would look at it. Okay. Um, and any of the guys we spoke about earlier, whether Hannah Arendt, okay, or Picasso, it's the characteristics that are important uh, um, and that shape them, of which commitment was an absolute fundamental aspects of it, because otherwise they wouldn't have bothered. I mean, why would, why, why would they go through the hell they have been through in order to be the leaders they have become? Martin Luther King could have given up. You know, we've, it's all been a, a deep commitment of time, <laughs> which has been welcome today. Um, but I think that the female leaders um, that, uh, you know, in particular, let's, let's uh, talk about like, I mean, just to raise Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand. I mean, and, and what we're seeing now are um, these women that are heads of state that are taking the lead in terms of the policy, both in terms of, of health, but also the environment in a very, very substantive and, and critical manner that is going to have a huge impact um, on um, you know, those places in the present, as we are already seeing, but also I think um, in those futures. And I think that that is something, you know, that's a longer discussion to go into, but even, you know, say with like Martha Rosler and the work that she did on Vietnam, um, we can invoke a number of other artists who, I mean, Goya, even the, the disasters of war, um, where there have been works that become the kind of icon or emblem of a particular moment and 
we don't know who that's going to be for this and it may be not be because there's a plurality. And I think that that plurality of voices is something that, um, you know, we have talked about and I think it's important to um, uh, not only representation, but then also um, how things get done and what is uh, being represented um, and in a just and equitable manner. So, um, so thank you. I, I really appreciate it. And I hope at some point we'll be in the same, we'll all be in the same space together again uh, and continue to do the work in the meantime um, as we are able to do for now. <laughs>